Um, hi everyone, welcome to ArtsFest Online and to this evening's talk with artist Paul Cox. Paul will be chatting to Dr Louise Fenton about how he approaches his work, his techniques and the importance of drawing. Paul will also be doing some live sketches for us, so that's going to be really exciting. Um, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A box and we'll go through them at the end. Uh, and just a quick reminder that this event is being recorded and as it is a public platform, please don't share any confidential information. Uh, so welcome both and over to you, Louise. Thank you. Thanks to Claire and ArtsFest and to Hope, who's in the background helping us with the technology. Um, so to start with, while I talk, I'm going to show some images of Paul's work, but um, tonight I'm going to give a talk about, well, we're going to talk and chat about Paul's life and his work and his methods of working. Last week I gave a lecture on Paul's work, so if you didn't see it, it is available on YouTube through the university channel, so do catch up on that if you want to know more about the different pieces he's done. And I've left my email on screen in case you have any questions after the event and you want to contact me. So Paul and I are going to have a conversation and he's also going to be, well, technology permitting, we are going to hopefully see him do a drawing through the conversation. The work of Paul Cox is instantly recognisable. His images are dynamic, they're playful, rhythmic and bright. And I became aware of Paul's work while I was an undergraduate at Wolverhampton back in the 1980s, which gives away our age a little bit. Um, but I was inspired by the work he did. At the time, everybody was doing airbrush and very slick illustrations. And I was sat with my sketchbook and my dip pen and didn't really know where I fit in the world. And then Paul came along and he really did validate my work and make me feel that there was a place. Um, and he's been a huge, a huge inspiration to me. Paul Cox was born in 1957 and he's married with two children. He studied at Camberwell School of Art, first of all on the foundation course in 1975, and then on the BA graphic design and illustration course from 1976. I'm just showing some images. So these images flick in, we will talk about through the talk, but um, just to give you an idea of his work, if you're not familiar with it. He graduated with a first class honours and then from 1979 Paul studied illustration at the Royal College of Art. He graduated from there with an MA in 1982. Since then he has worked as a freelance illustrator and painter. He has involved himself in an extraordinary number and variety of projects. Readers of newspapers and magazines on both sides of the Atlantic will instantly recognise his wonderfully fresh images. We are going to look a little bit about some of his um, published work, but also his drawing, because Paul's work, his drawing underpins everything that he does, and his style demonstrates the fluidity and the speed with which he works as his brushes dance across the paper. So it's my absolute pleasure and delight to welcome the enchanting artist, Paul Cox. Paul, thank you for being with us this evening. Well, thank you for having me, and it's a nice opportunity to talk about my work and share that with you and whoever's watching. <laughs> okay, so let's start at the beginning. When did you begin having an interest in drawing? Um, well, I suppose um, my father always drew a lot. He was an architect, and he, he would always be busy with his sketchbook drawing, and we'd go on holiday, and I'd see him working. And he encouraged me from an early age to do line drawings of things. And I, I, I did a lot of drawing and painting at school. I, I was very good. I mean, I had dyslexia, so I was left at the back of the class to really fend for myself. So I did a lot of painting instead, which seemed to be my way of getting <laughs> some work done, which the teachers uh, didn't really recognize at the time, but it was actually quite a good start for me, believing that I could do something that communicated with other people really from quite like when I was quite young. And did that, did you realize that you could have a career in illustration at that point or at oh, what point did you no, think? No, 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 I knew, I knew, I, I, I was interested in art and paint and drawing from very early on. I, I didn't really think about illustration, particularly as a, as a subject to follow. It was more gravitating towards it as I went through college because um, I started at, at, at 
I mean, I had a very good teacher at my school, um, a man called Ray Evans, who was also a professional painter as well as a teacher. And he encouraged me a lot in watercolor, particularly at school. And I knew I wanted to go to art school and that was the path I was on as a painter, as painting and drawing and enjoying watercolor. And then, then um, at art school, um, uh, Campbell was very academic in the sense that you did a lot of um, uh, very thorough life drawing and it was quite intense in the drawing and observational aspect and both in sculpture and in painting. But I chose to do graphics as a pathway because I realized drawing in as an end result was more where I wanted to be rather than as a means to an end in painting or sculpture. Mm -hmm. And it was illustration seemed to be a, an area where I could, where the drawings would just live on their own. Okay, they, they're, they're doing a job with some text or something, they have some purpose and a value, but also I was excited about the fact that they were available to a lot of people. I mean, they weren't just one thing on a wall somewhere. You know, the thing was, immediately accessible and, and and reproduced in huge quantities so a lot of people could see your work and that excited me um, so I came about it that way rather than being a lover of books and a great reader it was a, it was more through the act of drawing and the expression of drawing and who were your early influences who inspired you as a young artist um well I, I was brought up with artists only as a child and Caldecott, the, the, the nursery rhymes. And my father would sort of drum on the, on the side of the bed when the, the jovial huntsman and the horses. And I had uh, the wonderful thing about Caldecott, he did a lot of drawings in but the very little text and the drawings told a story as you follow them from one to the other. So it was like the, you could read between the drawings, so to speak, and and invent it a little bit like a scenario that, that what the things that weren't drawn that didn't need to be drawn, those were great. And also art is only particularly because there were there was such humanity and love in those those images. Uh, and I connected with them, particularly the Tim alone who comes back from being a sea, finding his mother in the tea room and looking through the window and the sort of romantic Okay, it was, it was, he saw the world in this very sort of, sort of comfortable way, but this was a story about a rather brutal um, separation from his parents and the reunification of, with them afterwards. So that, that was a great influence, art is only particularly and called the cop. And what about today? Is there anybody you particularly um, Yeah, I, I do. I, I, I like, um, um, a lot of actually look quite a few fashion illustrators who are still working pr with plastic materials and still um, um, Caroline Tomlinson, for example, and, and people like that. And um, they, they, they have a, um, what's nice is they're working mainly with a figure, but they're still using conventional tools rather than digital tools. So I, I, I tend to sort of respond better to, to those illustrators than the more, flat sort of digital way, um, yeah. Well, I think now would be a good point to um, suggest that you are going to draw for us. Today. Yeah, I, I, it's a bit scary, but I, I, <laughs> I've done this actually on a, on a Zoom. It's the first, my first Zoom call, so it's all pretty new to me. So I hope well, it They're a very work. kind audience we have, so. Well, um, that'd be very forgiving if it all goes very wrong. And if I've got my phone attached to my angle point, so if it falls off, at any point, you, you're going to have to bear with me, I'm afraid. But I, I, I thought I'd do a, a drawing a little bit like the drawing I do, would be doing outside anyway. So I'm using a brush pen that I use quite a lot, which is a lot smaller than what I would normally be doing because I usually work a lot larger. So, uh, so I start. So I start drawing something. I now think now would be a good yeah. a good time because um, you've got okay. a very distinctive style, and I think it would be good for people to okay. see how that. I'm going to share my my phone now with you. Let's see. What am I doing? Something. That's well, it. Here we are. It's Perfect. coming. Oh. That's it. Yeah. Is that, is that clear on the screen? Absolutely I don't know, clear. I don't know quite what you're seeing, Perfect. but I, I think it looks like. Well, it, I thought I'd do a, a drawing of a, of a kind of, it's quite useful to do a demonstration with a, um, of, of a, of a, using some of my watercolors and a, a brush pen. This is a sort of 
tools that I would be using anyway outside. This is a much smaller pen than the one I usually have, which is a much fatter brush pen. But the advantage is that you don't have to keep dipping things into a, a pot of ink all the time. Um, uh, um, these are these large um, water towers that you find on tops of New York um, buildings. That are, that are... And does it ever go wrong, Paul? Oh yes, it does sometimes. <laughs> it might go wrong, hideously <laughs> wrong tonight. The nice thing about these rooftops is that they're full of interesting bits of architecture and uh, strange air vents and ducts and all those odd, odd things. And you know, the building, uh, the building below. Can be very ornate and, and elaborate, but you know when it's not not visible to the eye, um, it doesn't. They don't seem to care too much about what's upstairs mm. on the top. Anyway, are you okay to talk while you draw? Yes, I can talk a bit. I've got to think a bit. <laughs> I won't interrogate you too much. <laughs> yeah, please, please, please talk. talk so you've away. got a very distinctive style. Is this something that happened organically, or is there a pivotal moment when you thought, "Oh, this yeah, is the style uh, I can it, it kind of happened with with the with the um, when I was doing the lucky gym drawings you just put up earlier for um, the Folio Society competition. Then that uh, that was um, quite a a, a formative moment when I, I, I just realized that the, that the drawing could actually express exactly what I was um, uh, thinking about the story and how it, it sort of uh, excited me. And um, it, it, it was a sort of rather magical moment when, when I, I realized that I could actually do a drawing which conveyed exactly those things. And, it was it was a, a very exciting thing to, to suddenly feel that, and a, a lot of the illustration kind of rather de developed from from those um, things. I'm using a finer pen now as well to, to just to delineate and draw some things which are in the, further in the distance. I, I'm kind of imagining I'm on a on a rooftop in in New York, and I, I do I have drawn out of windows and things which. Um, you, you have this lovely sense of the light and the um, the building shimmering in the dark with the light coming up from underneath and I'll, I'll try and convey that when I put the watercolour on but it's, it's, it's going to be very rough and ready I'm afraid so you're going to have you to work incredibly quickly well usually you have to because there's I you know there's a, there's a lot of things that can go awry when you're working outside you know you, you you've got to catch if something's moving past quite quickly you've got to catch them quite quickly and um, if um and, and you don't you, you know also on, in, in awkward awkward locations where you're going to be in the way like i did a lot of drawings in the meatpackers district in new york and i was I was very much in their way and they got very angry with me <laughs> and they kept pushing me out of the way. And I, I was struggling to do the drawing. And afterwards I went to a diner and all those chaps were in the diner eating their huge meals, plates of stuff, huge chops and steaks. And they saw me and they called, oh, come over here. And they said, show us what you were doing. And then this drawing was passed all the way around the diner and they were all very friendly then. <laughs> because I was in their way, they 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 were in really impatient, and I was I was sort of in getting the way of their their work. And uh, it's funny how that happens sometimes. But you know, to answer your question, yes, I do. I have had to work quite quickly, and I I I I, I, like, I like to sort of skip around the town quite a lot, and and, and uh, see sort of get as much of a feel of a place and to set up in one place alone and do a very long complicated drawing that's um going to um take a long time mm. is, is somehow gonna i got a sense that i'd be missing out missing out on other things that i wanted wanted to see so it's kind of necessary to do 
to to work at some sort of speed. So what I'm, I'm not going to draw much more on this now. This is just basically a bit of line work, which is what I would do outside normally. And in this instance, I'm going to just to demonstrate. I use a bit of this resist, which is a a, um, a latex based resist uh, on on the drawing to um, which, which which blocks out any any watercolor. It's, it, uh, it's like a masking fluid, but it's not as smelly. Um, it's obviously a, a more by the way, refined it's, one. It's, it's called rubble prep. Anyway, I, I put this on. I could put this on with a um, try, a very old paintbrush. Doesn't matter if it gets lost. And if you drag it across the um, the um, paper, very um, loosely. I feel like we're that. finding trade secrets now, Paul. I'm afraid so. I'm giving it all away, <laughs> and then and then. What we'll do is we'll do a little, a few little, I'm using this, this is a, a Japanese um, quill, I mean, bamboo pen. And that oh, I've seen a, those, yeah. A clobby, a rather irregular, cloddy um, line to it. And uh, I'll put a bit of that on. So you can draw around, all this drawing that I'm doing on here will be white. Once I put, I'm gonna use some quite dark washes on this, so you will see them. You'll see what I mean when when I when I do it. So, do you still have an element of surprise when you do a drawing? Yeah, things things you know things always are a little bit haphazard when you're putting the watercolor on. Um, not so much in the studio, but it, you know, out and about, you know, you can, things will go awry. You know, you, I was telling you the other day, like a drawing that got blown away halfway through doing it, and you know, you get into you can get into a bit of a a state trying to do that. So what, what we'll do, I think, is, is just leave this, because this takes a bit of time to dry, and I'm going to leave this, um, leave this to dry off, and then I'll put some more washes on in a bit later. Yeah? Okay, sounds like a plan. Okay, so I'll switch this off now. Yeah. 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 Okay. So if you stop sharing, and then that's I'll let it. That, let that, so that will dry. dry. While I continue to interrogate you, Paul. Might have to get a hair dryer to, to do the rest of it. Quite thick. Thing is, if you put it on quite thickly, it does does um, take a while to dry. I'm sure it'll be fine. Yeah. So do you ever work from photographic references or is um, most of your Yeah, well now work? with the computer, you can dial up virtually any 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 subject to get as reference. So I do use it for that. But um it is a little bit limiting in the sense that you 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 are only limited by how that photograph, which was taken probably by someone else. So it's your own reference that's different. But I, I try not to use. Um, I try to just do as much as I can from my imagination. Mm. And uh, before um, the internet, you know, you would just be limited to what you thought a particular thing looked like, and you just hope you could fudge it so you could get it right. But well, I know we had a conversation about the one you did for Radio Times with that aerial view of. Oh yeah, that was different. Was that, I, I, that was a view of the Albert Hall, which was for the Radio Times Proms cover, and it was quite a big job, important job, because of course, not so much the money, it was the, the fact that the, the magazine gets printed in mm. millions. So you know, a lot of oh, people. It was huge. Huge, it had yeah, huge yeah. circulation back so, then. So I get a bit, got a bit frightened. I got it. It's got to be a really good drawing. So I, I. I went to the Albert Hall and I walked all around it and and sort of tried to imagine what the top of it looked like and also the the building surrounding it um, and look what the roofs were all doing. But they also the idea was also to line the Albert Hall up with the Royal College of Music, Imperial College, and the Natural History Museum because they're all on an, on Albert's alignment and the drawings actually looks as though it was done from the top of his memorial because it's looking right down on top of Albert Tropical. So that was quite a nice sort of little conceit of mine, I know, but it was a nice thing to include. But I had to invent all those routes because there, there was no aerial. For, no know, Google, Google Earth, Earth then, Paul. No there Google were some aerial Earth. photographs of the Albert Hall, but none of the surrounding buildings to do any, any of that other stuff with. So it was quite a difficult job. <laughs> So when we talk about you, um, obviously not working from photographs unless you have to, but when you're outside, um, do you find that, that that could be a finished piece or is it very much that's a preparatory for something no, else? No, no, the, the, 
the, the outside drawings are generally finished very quickly afterwards in a hotel or somewhere. Um, and, and in fact, all the New York drawings I was doing for Blueprint were all done in a very small hotel room in uh, near Times Square, which was a quite dangerous place at the time to go to, because you know, it was quite rough then. And we, um, um, the, 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 the artwork, I mean, the, 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 what we tried to sort of talk a little bit about when, when you were talking before about the drawings that are done on the spot, they have to, they have to start with the energy of the place. So you're there drawing and reading the situation, whether it's taxis, buses, cyclists, whatever's going on, there's a vital element of people doing stuff. And you look, and you're talking a little bit about narrative as well. You look for figures that are doing certain things and they have always have a directional force. So they're going somewhere doing, or the aspect of deportment in a figure that's about to do something will lead your eye into a particular part of the drawing. So you're using figures to, they're, they're, they're interested, well, the narrative aspect is you, because I'm sort of conditioned to be an illustrator. So you see, is there a story going on here? What's going on between these people? But the energy of the place and those things has to be conveyed in that drawing. And to maintain the energy, you have to do the color work in an in a easier environment because I can't be out there with all my paints on the street. So I'm, I'm working in a space quite soon afterwards when it's still fresh and the mm -hmm. color goes down quite quickly as though it's done on the spot at the time. So it's, it's maintaining that kind of momentum really to yeah. make it sort of feel like a vital image, not something that you can do really painstakingly carefully. Would you, work, sorry. Sorry, I was say, would you work slightly differently in the studio? Yes, I do. Show? I mean, I mean, because you, you, you're in a much more comfortable environment, I will be, for a start, the sketches have to be approved by a client, so that's all sent off to them. Then I do, um, um, uh, 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 the preliminary work will be very quick sketches, then that's toned down to tighter ones, which I then send to the client. If that's approved, I'll go over the artwork. The artwork's done in the studio on, on large bits of watercolour paper mm. and then stretched by stretching, just damping the back of the paper. So I'm, the, the, the drawing is done over a light box so I can see the structure underneath. So it's a, it's a very different process, but you try and keep a certain sort of energy in the work even so, but it, the drawings do have a different feel about them. They're more, they're tighter and more sort of, uh, you say more organized than the more haphazard work I do. And when you are outside and studio, what sort of scale do you work to? And how do you work? How do you work when you're outside? Do you have to um, take an easel with well, you? I, no, 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 I wouldn't take an easel. That, that would be crazy. I would take, I take a, a large, about an A1 drawing board, handy, but they're, they're, they're big plywood boards, uh, thin, quite thin, uh, so it's not too heavy, but about five mil plywood which I'll clip five or six sheets of, of watercolor paper to with bulldog clips. Mm. I will have a variety of sizes. Some will be A1, some to A2, and maybe a, an A3 sketchbook as well. So I'll have that in a bag, quite a heavy bag that I card around. And then depending on the size of drawing I want to do, I will stand um, perhaps with the board on my hip or maybe on a little bin or something handy or a car which is helpful if they're parked and right to help because it's quite hot it's quite tiring standing for about an hour with a big drawing board but it's, the weather's not great you know it's that's always a problem and uh so i will i will do that um you know generally on a on, a, on that sort of size so the largest would be about a1 okay and how long would an a1 a2 a3 take you to draw, mm. um, I mean, we've uh, just seen how quickly you've done the drawing for well, us. Yeah, well, it would be, it would be, it's hard to say. It's sometimes a, a complicated building with a lot of structural little nuances that I want to pay attention to. Like I did a lot of drawings in Mexico uh, a year or two ago, and I, there, there were some very elaborate Baroque uh, facades. Mm. of some of these Spanish colonial cathedrals, mm. which are extraordinary. I think they got a Mexican indigenous people to help with the construction. So there are lots of little additional yes. bits that are not true to type in the, Mexi in, the, in the Catholic tradition. But it is actually, 
when you want to pay a lot of attention to something that is quite, um, uh, you know, the, what's caught your eye is the detail, then that will take longer because you're paying more attention to it. Another aspect is you can abbreviate a lot of stuff by drawing it quite simply. And that's going, you, you gotta let, in a drawing, you gotta have a center of attention or center of focus which is generally the first thing you are attracted to or interested in. And then as your eye needs the other information to place it, it will, it will, you will go into the distance and less important things that can be drawn in a more sort of uh, looser way, I mm. suppose. Um, how are we doing with the drawing? Are we ready oh, to, um, I think we're ready we'll, to go back here? I think we can. It seems to have dried off a bit. Yeah, okay. I think we can try. That's been about 15 minutes. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> too. I just thought I want okay, to make sure. I get myself, I've got to get okay. myself sorted out here. All right. Well, I think what we're going to do is, is uh, I've got, I'm just going to get the camera working again. I'll try this again. Be coming. Yeah, it takes a few seconds. Perfect. We yeah, we now we have your drawing again. Okay. It's a bit like Blue Peter, then. It is, isn't it? <laughs> it's at least you're not I doing it here at the next early. stage. <laughs> so, what I'm going to do is that I've got basically a collection of watercolors. This is my regular tin, which I've used for years. It's a Winsor Newton tin with a variety of uh, the most um, useful colors, which, you know, to my mind, you've got yellow ochre and ultramarine, cerulean, um, burnt sienna. But, you know, my color palette is quite sort of limited to that central area. Mm -hmm. I don't use bought green particularly very much. I like, I prefer to make my greens because you can make them cooler or warmer quite easily. Um, but Prussian blue, um, alizarin crimson and permanent rose are kind of quite popular with me. And these are bigger pans from Winsor They don't unfortunately make these anymore, but they were very useful for it when you want a lot of color. Yeah. And the, um, I'm going to just sort of lay on a bit of color quite loosely. Um, start with some of the warmer lighter colors. This is, this is um, cadmium lemon. They, they don't sell these in the big pans. Cadmium colors, because it's poisonous. They, they're keeping oh. it, um, they can only get little ones because they're worried about children. Yes. Swallowing them. Yeah. Anyway, I've got some. So this area down here is going to be quite warm and light because it's um, there's some light coming up from down below. So you can get some of that on quite quickly. So do you have in your mind, as soon as you start painting, you've got an idea of where light is going to be and... A little bit with this, because it's going to be dark. It's a night scene. So you, I'm starting with some of the lighter colours. Um, and then it'll just start to get darker and darker, I hope. And I'm loving the sound effects. Well, that tinkling sound <laughs> is my water pot. I, I was telling you, I, I did this thing on the Today program for the, for the three hours once, which was um, quite daunting. And uh, the, the uh, noise of the tinkling was going on being broadcast. And I, I, I was getting these frosty looks from, from um, what's his name, John Humphreys. He wasn't happy at all. And, and uh, I realized it was there was a red light was on, meaning that the, it was being broadcast all this tinkling. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, this is a bit of the darker colors. This is just some um, uh, um, what's it? Um, French ultramarine and permanent rose coming down. And the, it's, I love violet colors like this, so the, it's quite nice to yeah, it occurs quite a lot in your work, doesn't it? Yeah, it's quite, it's, I find the reductive quality of negative temperatures in shadow is quite nice. So I use this um, ultramarine quite a lot. Mm. Um, get some light coming in. And do you, you, do you just do this as an intuition or is well, it I have painted this, this, this I, I, I've drawn this before, so I thought, you know, yes, so I've got I, the one from earlier, so we can do a Blue Peter moment yeah, later. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's sort of, 
uh, it helps having done it. I mean, I, I, I was did some teaching at West Dean College, and and I realised that they were all being rather cautious with their watercolour, and um, I started doing these demonstrations. And this this sort of picture was one that was quite nice to do. And and you suddenly they suddenly realise, oh, you can just chuck it on. <laughs> <laughs> You I mean, you were, you use watercolors in a, an unconventional way, don't you? Well, I don't think there is a rule about how you use watercolor. No. You just do it. You find your way of, of doing it, which is um, quite, um, you know, it has to be your own sort of express it in your own way. I think I, I it, this this way of working came to me just because I I thought it was. Um, it connected with the speed and the and the and the and the the sort of light, the vitality, I suppose, of the lively things I wanted to be drawing. Yeah. So that made it made sense to to be doing it like that. Um, and I read, and we've talked before, that sometimes you will actually mix the colours on the paper as well. well I, I'm kind of doing a bit of that already with this. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm going to. You see, I'll put I'll put I'll put a bit of stronger colour in, into the um, warmer colours. And when we talk about materials, I know mm. we, we're digging into your trade secrets a little bit. Um, mm. What what sort of sketchbook are you using there? Oh, it's just a, this is just an ordinary Bockingford watercolour paper. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's uh, slightly rougher than what I usually use, which is a, this is a, uh, usually it's a knot surface, which is, between rough and and um, and rough and smooth, but I I I, I will the paper I, I tend to like to use for um, my large drawings is is um, um, what's it um, Fabriano Artistico, yeah. which is very nice paper. Um, hold on. Well, and you said you use you said you use brush pen, and we saw that was the cartridge one, was it that you were yeah, using? Yeah, yeah. So it's a standard. Um, uh, um, what's it called? Where is it? Yeah, it's, this is this thing. It's just oh, it's a, the Pentel, isn't it? The Pentel, Pentel thing, and, and it just takes little cartridges. But I have another. This this. Um, I have a variety of other. Fat, fatter, big, bigger ones, which are which are actually quite quite. Um, you get what I quite like about the fatter brushes. You you get a, you can get a tonal quality to the brush work mm. when you pull it as a dry brush over the paper. Mm. And that's um, also this is the ink I'll use some um, uh, Indian ink uh, for my dip pens and things. This is acrylic ink, which is quite nice. Mm. These, these sort of dip pens I use for drawing as well. These are finer pens. And this is just a household brush that's used for, um, it's a rough brush and it doesn't matter if it gets gunk in it. <laughs> uh, what I'm going to do now is going to use a bit of quink, which is a wonderful stuff. This, I love quink. quink is, um, you introduced me to quink yeah. in 1987. <laughs> like quink, strong with quink, it's very fugitive. And will fade in the light it, with light, so um, can have a problem. I tend to mix it with um, Higgins ink to um, so that I'm. Uh, uh, it's not going to, um, you know, if it fades at all, the, the Higgins permanent ink will stay. So. Mm. And is it the same materials, Paul, whether you're doing a commission piece or a sketch? Yeah, yeah, same sort of stuff. Mm. So the watercolour hasn't completely dried yet, so it's going on around it quite nicely. And Quink has a lovely way of separating into different colours as well, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's, it's amazing that. And of course, I'll show you in a minute because it, it, I got some here. So I'll be very careful with it. It's, um, it's wonderful with bleach. Yes. Cut, cut back in. You can see here now that where I put the resist on, that's that's actually protected the paper mm -hmm. from um, from the Quink. So it's it's um, work, working as a as a um, 
And is the resist that you're using, is that one that it's that kind of latexy you can rub yeah. up afterwards? Yeah, that's that's the that's the sort of thing, yeah. We just enjoy watching you paint for a moment, Paul. And this is obviously New York. Um, is mm. this a place that is dear well, to you? Well, not, not a definite. I mean, I've done quite a lot of um, roofscapes from the East Village and places when you're not quite so high up and you're all these all this roof paraphernalia is in the foreground. And it, it's just sort of, it's, it's, it, was, it was actually one of my first nights in New York. I, I, I opened the hotel window and I could hear all the traffic and yes. the noise and everything going on down below and it, it was just such a wonderful you know it was sort of it's so exciting to to be in the city and to hear all that going on and it, it it was a rather magical moment and I, I I suppose these sort of paintings are all kind of remind it or remember reminding mm. me of that of that and you've traveled quite a lot with your drawing and painting is there a Favorite place in the world? Um, um, I mean, the cities uh, that I've loved and drawn. I mean, Rome, particularly uh, Barcelona, is a favorite. Um, mm. uh, Siena, there's a place called Pienza, which is rather remarkable architecturally. Uh, Jamaica, I loved drawing there. Um, basically, anywhere in Spain. Um, that's about it, actually. I'm not going to do a lot more now. That looks what great. I, what I will do though, is, 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 is apply some bleach because that is um, going to start taking some of the black out. Mm. It's a bit of a mess, but you can get an idea. Um, I'll get some more. I follow the Ashcan school on Instagram. And there's a lot of painters that were painting in the 20s and 30s, not like the Canning group in London. It's mm. rather murky scenes of the city. And it's quite interesting that there was this parallel business going on at the same time. And um, uh, I, I, I find it it's quite nice to know that the appeal of the the you know, people, there was paintings of, of women hanging washing out on top of these rooftops, which were very, you know, about the modest life going on and little observations of things that weren't very important, but were very significant to the artist's observation. And I love that mm. when someone's seen some moment like that. And I think it's important to capture those moments in life, isn't it? I think that's the, that's the thing about you know artists being sort of reporters on the times that they're in and yeah. conveying what's what's happening in front of them. So I'm just putting the bleach on with the dry brush. Does that mean that paper deteriorates over time, or is it? I thought it would, but I I I sold one of these roofscape paintings to a friend of mine uh, that was about 20 years ago oh wow okay and still i thought the bleach would actually eat into the paper but it, it doesn't seem to do that and it throws whole new palette doesn't it into yeah. the sky it's a bit over over the top this <laughs> it's nice just to do something to play with the colors Is that is that your bamboo brush, uh, bamboo pen again? Yeah, that's that's right. Yeah. And again, this this is this paper is is curling because I've got it so wet. It's curling mm. up quite a lot, and consequently, 
it's um you get this pooling effect where the paper goes into these little things little little furrows so if, if you know it's quite good to actually stretch paper mm. um when you're going to do something like this that's about it really i don't think I need very much more well, it's a bit of a mess but i think you <laughs> get the lively. idea of um i mean it looks quite lively and, and uh dramatic anyway <laughs> it does <laughs> i think i think we'll switch it off now <laughs> okay and then will that dry in time for you to peel off or would you do that just at a later um, time i might it might it might be dry enough because what what i would do it, when this is dry when that's peeled off i will then reintroduce you can introduce more watercolor to mm. the areas which you've used the the gum on because they're the paper is then raw again to paint on Mm. Whereas um, with the bleach or any other thing like that, you won't you won't be able to do that. Yeah. Okay. That looks great. Thank you. So we stop sharing. Lovely. <laughs> okay. So blueprint was an important development. You just mentioned. Yes. yes was, it was, was a very influential publication as well. So how did your involvement with that arise? Um, more or less by chance, I'd been working at the Architectural Press doing uh, a book, which was my, one of my first jobs from Campbell, actually. And it was a lot, I was working at the photocopier and I met an art director called Simon Esterson, who was the working as a designer for the Architects Journal. And that was the first time I met him. And then later on, um, I think he got, after I left the Royal College, he got me to work for the Architects Journal, doing some reportage for him. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was then approached by Dan Sujik to start this magazine. So Simon um, and a few of us, um, there were about a small team of people got together and uh, with the help of uh, various people like Terence Conran and, Rod, uh, and, and uh, there were quite a few Fitch Associates and people like that who allowed us to use their offices at the weekends. So no one was paid anything. And we just sat around, put the magazine together. It was nice for me because I illustrated a quite lonely business. You work on your own. Mm. So working in a team, doing something together was really nice. And Martin Collier, who I also worked with a lot uh, on The Listener, he was involved. So we all pitched in and there were great parties where we all <laughs> really took over funny building sites and sat with, with little, hat, little builders hats on and we drank blue champagne. Oh, it was intriguing. It was champagne with blue curacao, which is because of blueprint, obviously. But yeah. the nice thing about the magazine was huge. It was a very big format. Yeah. Simon said, just draw whatever you want. You know, I wasn't like told, oh, you must do certain some number or whatever. So I go on to a place, I think it was New York or Milan, um, Edinburgh, Glasgow, um, did, did a lot of places for the magazine because they were going to feature architects and designers doing work in those cities. So they wanted a color piece about the place. So I would do those sort of things. And it was lovely because for a start, no one gave me that degree of freedom or quite that amount of freedom. And, and the drawings were huge. The, the yeah. magazine itself was, was vast. It had to make itself a little smaller eventually, but it was a big, big production. Anyway, it was a lovely, lovely thing to work for when when i was doing it and how long were you with them how long did you do that for well, we must have done about five or six years maybe yeah. it was all through the 80s is when we started it yeah and then you also had a very good relationship with folio and i've yeah. done quite a lot with them how did that come about well folio has been a huge and very important client of mine i i i started um it all goes back really to lucky jim mm. king of the amos because it, it wasn't for that I wouldn't have done those drawings and the the, the folio competition at Royal College um, was to illustrate a book of your choice and this book was on the list and I, I had never read it before I was so sort of transported in, in, in hysterics I thought it was this a wonderful book I, and that that spurred me on to do those drawings but anyway the, 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 the competition was judged by David Driver from the Times who gave me my first work after leaving college as well. And um, the Folio Society saw those drawings and within a few months of me leaving college, they commissioned me to illustrate the Irish RM for them. And 
that was my first book for Fernio, right at the beginning of my career. And I'd been working for them ever since, um, mm -hmm. 30 odd books now. But the, that book was such an important book because I, I'd been, the fee for the, for the whole book was what I'd been used to living on for a whole year. So yeah. I thought, I'm going to spend a good deal of time doing all the reference. I, I went to Ireland. I went to the little village where the, where the authors lived. I, I looked, you know, I did a lot of thorough work to, to, to work out how to do these drawings. But when I came to the drawings, I was so, they were so careful and, and sort of tight. Look at them now. I thought, oh, what a lost opportunity. And they were used terribly condensed on the page. And, and, the, and subsequently working with Joe Whitlock, Blundell, who was the art director I worked with a lot, he gave me, like Simon, this is in a lot of freedom to just draw what I wanted to do. And he, we, we did a lot of PG Woodhouse together. And mm. I was just sort of taken away by PG Woodhouse. He sort of, his sort of effervescent love and life and optimism about things was so infectious. And we made quite a good sort of partnership with the drawings and sometimes in the night when I was working late because there were a lot of drawings, hundreds of drawings I did for the series of books, I kind of feel his presence. It was a nice, nice sort of moment to think I may have got it right. <laughs> it's a bit yeah. crazy. And your style is very well suited to the people. I, I, so. I hope he, he would have done as well. <laughs> Look on you favourably. Yeah, yeah, that was fun. And we talk about drawing as key to your work. Um, how frequently do you draw? Is it something that you do when you travel or is it a daily? Um, more, 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 more when I'm traveling. I'm drawing a lot for jobs in the studio. And that's mm. a sort of kind of regular kind of drawing. The interesting drawing, which is what I, what I do outside, I usually do when I'm away because I'm in a different environment. And that's always visually stimulating when you're surprised by new stuff. The, tr the, the trick is to get excited about what's just down the road. And, and that's really what, what I want to be doing and don't do enough of, and, and I would like to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and you said that we've talked about traveling. Post pandemic, what would be, where will be the first place you will visit? Um, I don't know. I mean, there, there's so many places really to, to think. I, I think Spain, probably, and maybe Southern Italy. I, I think there, there are there's still some pretty amazing places to see in mm. those countries and they're not that far. I mean, Colombia, Cuba, there's a lot of, I'm, I'm going back to the Spanish colonial thing where they did, they did their colonialism so well and yeah. they, with such a, a, a potent, so, so their buildings are wonderful to, to draw. Um, but uh, again, Italian, I, I love to go to this southern, southern Italy as well, um, maybe back to Siena. There are, there are lots of places not so far, but I, I, I don't know yet. <laughs> it's been a very <laughs> strange a time it living has been. quite carelessly in these places, drawing for people and mm. imagining a world out there that we can't really get to yet. But at least your work transports us to some of those places. Well, I hope it does without people. Oh, you got that wrong. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm doing it with some drawings of London. I, I started before the pandemic, and my um, agent, uh, Alison Eldred, she's, uh, we, we, we're sort of working out how to maybe do a book of these London drawings, going back as well, comparing them with drawings I, I did back in the 80s, showing how things yeah. have changed a lot. And then it's, it's interesting going back to Docklands, for example, it's, it's working out how the bridges are all being made bigger to cope with more trains. And the, there's locations where I did drawings, like I did a drawing of the, of the city airport for Punch magazine. And there were, there were these tiny little planes. There was a chap on a, on a, on a step ladder cleaning one of the engines with a, with a broom. Can you believe it? And I got a drawing of it. And now it's sort of quite a major airport. So yes, it is. All that's happened in those years. And so it's quite nice to think of a way of trying to get, the, get those things together. And I think sometimes, I don't think you're guilty of it, but I think sometimes we neglect what's on our doorstep. We're always looking further afield. Yeah, yeah I know. It's very easy to be, um, I mean, blasé, I suppose, about what, what is on one's doorstep. And London is, for me, I mean, I, I'm, we're living now in London. And, and um, we've lived at other places before, but um, particularly London is a very vibrant and exciting place to be 
with a lot of material that easy to hand to, to work with. Um, I think the, I, when the pandemic started, I thought, oh, God, I can get out and I can go and draw without the traffic getting to me. Yeah. And then I thought, oh, no, it's all a bit sad. And, and the yeah. whole point of being out and about, seeing life going on and being interested in what you, what, what's happening is, is, is a city in its, all its vitality with the traffic, the buses, mm -hmm. the cars. And the, so you, you want all of that bustle. So I, I, I've not really gone ventured out. Um, but will do hopefully yes yeah, of course now we've talked a lot about drawing and sketchbooks do feature quite mm. prominently in your work and I can see tantalizing just to your I don't know if it's your left or your right <laughs> yeah, I've got some to, uh, to share with you yes um, how's it what we're we going to do about the drawing so, so well the... I can move that aside I, I, I think it's maybe drying off a little bit later to um to, to try and rub off some of the gum, but. Okay, so I think if we can look, have a sneak peek in yeah. some of your sketchbooks, and then we'll finish with the unveiling of your drawing, <laughs> your painting. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna switch the uh, camera back on. <clears throat> this is a, this is a quite a large book, much larger than, uh, I normally use, which is, um, uh, I'm going to wipe something down because I don't want to get bleach and ink all over it. <laughs> um, I don't usually use books as large as this, but it's a, it's a it's quite a nice thing to have if you're not doing a um, a uh, these, these are some drawings of Barcelona. I, I, I push it up. Yeah, yeah okay. That's fine. Lovely. That's a bit yeah, perfect. perfect. Can you see that? Yeah. Yes, that's great. Thank you. These, these were some of the line drawings that I'm, I, I may have added some washes to later, but I, I chose not to because I quite like them as, as line drawings. So sometimes you would just you will leave them as black. Yeah, and white. yeah, yeah. Mm. But this is just this could have had some colour on because it's just enough bare bones line work there for colour to go on later. This was a favourite square in in Barcelona, Plaza Real. There's a drawing of this in the um, uh, blueprint I did where, where I went to Barcelona for blueprint and. Uh, the square was fantastic because the, the 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 light was very low coming in from the left hand side across the square, and there were a lot of people in the sunshine, obviously, and no one on the other. It's like the, the shadow defined where everyone was going to be standing. Great palm trees and things. Anyway, this is a, quite a big, fat book. It's quite a few um, drawings, some colour ones. People was all of this done this on one trip? trip? Was this just yeah, one? yeah? That's in the cathedral. I was intrigued in the cathedral. I had these geese all plucking <laughs> away, it's rather nice. I do love the black and white ones, Paul. I think they're, yeah, got, they're, they're, they're really quite they're dynamic. That's, yeah, that's in the Ramblas in the cathedral. Which is quite an incredible space. Yeah, yeah. We were staying just opposite the cathedral here. Once at night. Anyway, this is just a it's not it's not a not a typical sketchbook, this as, as uh, I would generally use this the, the smaller the smaller books. Yeah. In my pocket more. And were most of these drawings done actually on location? Yes, these were all done outside. Yeah. This this little these little books these are little A three, A six sketch brownie sketchbooks and the, what, the useful thing about these they can go in your pocket. Yeah. And you can be very unobtrusive when you're drawing because I have a technique of of drawing if you if you keep your head down and then just move your eyes someone won't necessarily know you're drawing them so that's quite a good trick. Unless they're looking straight at you when you look up, then you, you're, you're caught out. 
Um, yeah, and they make eye contact with you at <laughs> the precise moment. Yeah, this is a little book. I'm going to bring this a bit nearer. If I do that. Yeah, that's great. Thank that you. Gonna work? Yeah, yeah, that's perfect. Um, this was a, a trip. I start books sometimes with drawings of the journey, like going yeah. on the aeroplane. Um, can you see that? Yes, mm. we can. Yeah. Um, oh, is, why is it tipping that way? Ooh. Strange. Oh, that's it. Uh, yeah, you've got to yeah. do everything back to front. <laughs> yeah, and then um, this is arriving in Barcelona. This is this is for a trip for the Sunday Times. Uh, I did for Norman Lewis's um, stories, and so these little mm. drawings were done just to get me into the rhythm of drawing before I did the bigger main drawings, which were more detailed. I think Louise had some of these on her, on her talk. Yes, I did. Yes, yeah. I remember putting these in. Anyway, this is the actual book. This is a restaurant. And, and this is my room. And I put all my pictures up I was doing on the walls all around the room. And uh, it's nice, nice having the, 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 the book just as a little document of, of of the moment and reminding and these chaps these sailors these, these are fishermen i had to draw a lot of them for the story and uh, of course i had to draw them as though they were in norman lewis's story but in fact they were really just interested in all the topless girls sunbathing <laughs> around the, around the fishermen and i think what's lovely about using sketchbooks is that you do remember the moments that you do them it's not yes. like taking a quick snap it's absolutely it very takes much... you right right back to, to the time and, mm. uh, and the of... smells and the sound yes, and the place. yes yes absolutely anyway you get the idea they're amazing paul and um this little book was the whole book would have been done during that that one trip and um I suppose it must be about a couple of hundred little drawings. Some of them are very shaky. Oh, there's the room with all the pictures <laughs> stuck up on the wall. These are the drawings that I had to run back to the Sunday Times with to illustrate this article. And that was quite an important trip. They, they sent me there for about a week. Mm. Um, I'd only just learned to drive, and so it was quite a scary business driving on the wrong side of the road <laughs> and trying to get your yeah. drawings done in time for the paper yeah. there's another little book i can't remember what this was oh, this is the trip to ireland i told you about when i went yes. for the irish rm and i started off this is my little trip all the way down to skibbereen and castle townsend in the south of ireland again this is my trip on the train and going on the boat but again it's a lovely document yeah of your journey this is a nice drawing this is of a couple on the train and they're, they're asleep leaning against each other i just thought it was a very tender moment you do remember a lot of these yeah you things. do oh there's another there's and i think the same as i did actually. i mentioned in the talk you know people are always a little nervous, but sketchbooks are the place to be carefree and not to be too yeah. precious about what's going in. Absolutely, no, and 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 also it's uh, we're talking a little bit about sort of as so though you you can get into into practice. This is my bicycle, mm. and this is amazing castle I was staying in, in Castle Townsend. Look at it, incredible. And these all these houses were where, were referenced for the for my drawings for the Folio Society. I recognise that one. <laughs> it's my room in the castle, looking out over the harbour. And there's my bike. I had to ride seven cycle seventy miles from Cork to Castle Townsend with all my painting stuff on my bike. It was quite a <laughs> big deal. It's yeah. not all glamorous, is it? Life as an illustrator. Uh, no, there's some nice moments. It's Dublin in the rain. But, uh, anyway, you can go off for ages. <laughs> I've got hundreds <laughs> of these little things. These are particular favourites because they're, they're a little older. And uh, but um, you know, it's nice to dip back into them. And also, you, you. Um, I'll just switch that off now. So stop that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. But they are, they're a, an, an archive of your work, but they're also reflections of time and place. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I don't yeah. think you necessarily get that with photographs. 
Well, I think the reason you don't is when you take a photograph, particularly if it's just a quick snap for reference, you're not spending that much time in that space. And it, when you are in a place for a bit, you, 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 uh, a lot of things will happen during that time, which mm. you will you know, be surprised by. You'll want to put them into the drawing, but they, it's more about a, a being in, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, moment of time which is a lot longer than the time that you would take a photograph so obviously yeah. the smells of the incidents the you know someone in jamaica for example draw, i was drawing in port antonio and i was drawing a uh, i often have a lot of people ground, gathering around so they they'll all someone went past with one of those fruit carts and I've drawn the quite a lot before. And so I, I, I started to draw it, although he'd actually got out of, gone away. And, and this chap standing beside his saw what I was trying to do. He said, oh, I'll go and get him back again. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no, no, you don't have to do that. I've, I've got it. You have to retain in your uh, retina the, the image of something a little bit like a camera. Mm. When you see it to try it, so you can, you can draw it, you know, uh, draw it as you saw it, because the people aren't going to stay still very long or they're often moving past quite quickly. So you, you have to, you have to capture that, you know, really read it and see it quite clearly and training the eye to capture these things is, is really why you need to be drawing quite a lot and frequently to yeah. keep that sort of your eye tuned into being able to work like that. And I think we had a conversation, you likened it to learning an instrument. It's that keep practice. It's very, it is a bit like that. You know, you can get out of practice if you don't do it. And the rhythm of, of it also, the connectivity with your eye and hand mm. and uh, imagination as well, that's all got yeah. to connect up. And the, the weird thing is people who, who rather criticise drawing as though what, what's the point of doing that when you, a camera can do it? I mean, why, why would you want to do all that? And, and they don't realise that what you're drawing is not just exactly what you see, how you see it. You're bending stuff around all the time. You're moving the perspective. I adjust the perspective. I, I do a sort of wide angle thing. I bend it this way and that way. And I'll move, a, I actually might move a building slightly nearer or put something about and you, know, you can play around like that it's not drawing exactly what it is but it's, it's to convey the feeling of being in that place in that time as you experience it so that's that's the exciting thing about the way the drawing can communicate your interpretation of something and then for people who are familiar with the place they'll look at it and say oh i never quite saw it like that or maybe that's wrong or whatever and the weird thing about drawing in New York, I was sort of really excited about it, but all the New York illustrators I was with, who I meet with my rep there, they said, what's, what's, why are you so interested in that? What's so, <laughs> it's, not, yeah. it's not that exciting for them, but it was, it was for me. So I'd be out with my sketchbook all the time, drawing in the, in the diners and in the back of a taxi, all those things. And they think, why, why would you want to do that? <laughs> but it's just <laughs> because it was, it was interesting and exciting to see. And I think on that note, because we need to draw things to a close so I can go through the questions that- Oh, right, we, okay. Um, do we want to have a look at the drawing? Yeah, I think, I think it's, it's probably okay to, to rub some of it off. You've just that. brought that lovely back to New York right at the end. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just see if I can open it up again. I'll have to move the um, angle poise a bit. Come on. Oh, perfect. A bit nearer. Yep, that's lovely. Got that? Yes, we've got it right in the middle. Well, I think it's it's just about dry enough. I think what, what I just do with my thumb or finger, just rub it over and, and the gum will come off. What will happen if it's not quite dry, it, it just tears the paper slightly. Oh, okay. It's, it's okay, it's, it's coming off okay. It's... Again, great sound effects. <laughs> Now, 
the other thing you can do with it is, is, is paint, paint it through a stencil, the, the gum, which is, mm. you can get quite a nice hard edge or soft edge on it. Okay. That's most of it off now. So what I'll do now is just to diminish the white because I, I'm not too happy with the, the bright white in, in this. So I will use the um, uh, use some of this um, lemon uh, uh, in yellow to uh, the water. So it's quite useful to change your water at this point. Particularly if using delicate, paler colours, you know, they just get muddy very quickly. We haven't got time for that. So I'll just take some, um, take some of the lights out. So the, it, it, mean, it means the brighter whites are near nearby. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you get a sense of um, the contrast is, is sort of more acute in the foreground than in the distance. And also, because the quink is soluble, yes. if you put anything on it, it, it will just run. So it's one of those things that is quite hard to control, but very nice to um, play with. That's just about it. That looks fabulous. If you do, you want me to share the image that you actually did for this? Yes, theme? yes. It's not identical, but it's kind of on the theme and it's relevant. I suppose if you can put it up. If I good. ask everyone to take a good look at that, because I don't think I can share at the same. I can't share while Paul's sharing. So Paul's going to take his down, and then I'll try and put up the image. Okay, I'm turning this off now. Okay, and then let me see if I can share mine. Mine's disappeared now. No, I don't think mine's going to work. Oh, Should well, no way. Never mind. Um, so, Paul, we've got some questions. Are you mm -hmm. okay, Sue? Yes. So, fine. first of all, a couple of comments. Claire's actually put a link in the chat to the talk that I gave last week on Paul's career, so you can find that. And then Nicholas Sims, just a comment, really, saying that he loves your black and white Barcelona drawings. Oh, thank you. That's kind of you to say that. <laughs> and then questions. Okay, so the first one. Um, I find watercolours to be quite unforgiving in terms of how a mistake can easily be shown. How do you navigate this in terms of being careful, especially with your illustrations? Um, that's the trouble. I, I'm very careless with watercolour. <laughs> that's the key. Yeah, and, and in a way, to learn, although when I did start painting, I was very tentative and use very limited color palette. And I think that's when you start, uh, the temptation is to get a paint box with every color in. Mm. If you keep your palette down to about four colors and really look at the light that you're trying to convey rather than thinking about the colors of individual things and their local color, think of it as a tonal thing. And then uh, working from the light to the dark. So you're using your lightest colors first and not drawing, not painting everything. So you, you know, we, that earlier image you showed in my talk of the little Provencal farmhouse with mm. all in those greens and blues, that's the sort of thing I was doing to kind of learn my craft. And also my art teacher also used a lot of um, very um, simple, like Prussian blue, blue, burnt umber, burnt sienna, and yellow ochre. Those, all those sort of 
And Didn't I think it's a good cold. practice. I think it is a good was... practice to be doing that. And, and also, the other thing to do is also to, to make you a little, little less cautious. Uh, it's not to be precious about thinking, oh, I must do a special piece of work now. And this, mm. if, you, if you paint, um, as I, I did a bit back then, with quite thick watercolour and gouache, actually, if you paint in a very opaque way, which is not like proper watercolour painting at all. My art teacher taught me this. If you use the colour very opaquely, let it dry, you can put that image, and it's probably best if it's stretched, but it's not essential, in the shower or the bath, and use a scrubbing brush with water just pouring over it very, very, very gently. You can take the colour off, and the reduction, you can get some lovely effects with um, losing colour. And yeah. what's left, and the and the tools you use to take it off will leave directional marks. So, you know, if you're drawing something which has a particular movement or line, you can, you can emphasize that with that method. But also, the, the main thing is to be try and be free with the, with the material and learn. I think it's not being precious, isn't it? We we get very Definitely, precious yeah. with things. Yeah. Okay, moving on from that. Also, what are your favourite techniques with watercolour and any recommended techniques and favourite brushes that you use? Again, that's that's quite sort of, um, you know, my favourite, uh, my favourite watercolours are Winsor Newton. I tried, I tried Schwenke and the and American colours and, and um, they, 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 they sort of suit, suit the, the, the wind and Newton colours suit my temperament more because they're slightly softer, quite, the binders are less easy to release the pigments, whereas the Schminkies are much more, much brighter and sharper. Um, these, these are particularly nice. Uh, the brushes, um, they're, they're very good, um, they make them now, these, they're, they're um, what are they called? Um, Connoisseur, the, the pro art brushes, they're very like sable brushes, but they're completely synthetic and they, they take quite a lot of punishment. So I'm using, I'm not very careful painting, but the, the best brushes obviously are sable brushes, and um, but they're very expensive. And if you're not careful with brushes, you know, you don't want to be ruining very expensive brushes. They're good. Paper, as I said before, was, was the you know, Fabriano papers I like. I use a lot of Abbey, um, I remember some uh, arsh paper. Uh, it was a laid paper, had, had laid means it's been made with little lines in it. And they're very nice for a texture. If you run a dry brush over a laid paper, it gets a very nice effect as well. Mm -hmm. That's all my trade secrets, and that's it. I know, <laughs> I know. I, know. We're I don't know anything wonderful. else now. <laughs> Giving it all okay. away. Somebody's asked, uh, having moved out, moved out of London at one stage and then moved back, mm. have you found that quite an exciting experience in that the city may have changed during that time? Very much so. Yes, I think, you know, having um, been out of the city about 20 odd years um, was it's quite a long time to be away from it. It changed markedly. And um, every time I came back, so I had to for work and doing stuff, you could see things you know, there were there was it was the city became far more uh, European and more people doing things outside mm. on the streets. I don't know whether it was a smoking ban or whatever it was. There was more activity, more sociable stuff happening, and it looked more fun. And the more fun it looked, the more I wanted to be back <laughs> back there. And I did. I, I always had missed it, but um, you know, it's just how it goes, really. Yeah, um, Nicholas has said um he can't draw from the imagination and did you use friends for the drawings for gentleman jim uh lucky jim i think it was or mm. were those from the imagination they were all from the imagination and i think the why i i it kind of clicked because i i'd done a lot of life drawing at school so it was like you were in art school before at campbell where we, we did it sort of almost every day and i think working for the model was a discipline that was quite useful as a formative thing just to get to know how the body works but when Linda Kitson started teaching at Camberwell she mm. said go out and draw the world that's life that's where it's happening outside and people drawing people in pubs people in cafes every, every the people around that are posing for you without you even you know them knowing it so that they're, they're your life those are the people you want to be drawing 
the people yeah. around and about. And um, she she brought to the live class exotic burlesque models, and she played <laughs> music, and that was a really lively live class, and yeah. and uh, that was very useful. But I, I would draw. The more you can draw figures um, from life out and about, the more you'll be able to draw them from your imagination if and when you have to. Mm -hmm. And I think that's drawing them to a close. So I'm going to ask, um, what are you working on at the moment and what's next for you? Um, well, I've been working on a series of um, uh, drawings for a, um, a, a, it's, it's a, it's a sort of an epic poem that someone's publishing privately and I've just done about 20 odd drawings. I can show you some sketches. I've just been, it just shows you, I'll just switch that back on so you can see the, how this works. When I do um, drawings for books, I will generally do these little very quick pencil sketches, which are, oh, okay. which are very, very rough. But the concept is is all there in in these little drawings, uh, and these this this was a great procession coming down um, Marlow High Street with all these figures. Someone playing the bagpipes, someone with a net, and all of these figures. Th this actually becomes very like the finished illustration. But it's what mm. I do as I'm reading the the story, and. Um, I will then make a selection of, of from from all these sketches. I'll make a selection of the ones that I'll want to do. And there's a chap in a boat, and there's this building. You can see more yeah. or less what's going on in in most of these. So that's that's. I've just finished those drawings, and um, I'm working, as I said, on this London thing. Alison Eldred has got some of the London pictures up on my website if you want to go on to her. It's, it's through her, but some of those London pictures I'm working on at the moment. Um, they're, 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 it's, it's, it's a project that sort of really went into, into, sort of into limbo because of the lockdown, but I hope to yeah. start that up again. But that's really what I want to be doing now, yeah. <laughs> well, I think that probably draws, are there any other questions at all? We're still looking at your hands. Oh, yes, I'm just sort of rubbing my hands up. I'll close that. Oh, somebody's just said they want to say what a fantastic talk that was. Oh, that's kind of you. Thank you. Yeah. It was, it and was, thank uh, you so much. Oh, thank you. Well, it's been a pleasure. And uh, but it, for me, it's been an absolute pleasure because, as you know, <laughs> I, I was a, I didn't want to turn into a stalker or some crazed fan. <laughs> but thirty odd years on, it oh, was no, lovely to funny, though, finally get to see yeah. you again. Yeah, well, it's been it'd be nice to share these things and to. I was a bit apprehensive about the camera falling off my angle. No, no, it all worked perfectly. Work well. yeah, so, yeah. so we're getting lots of thank yous, Paul. So yeah. it just remains. I don't know, Claire, if you want to come in and say anything else. But I, for me, Paul, I just want to say a huge thank you for all the support in putting together the talk last week and oh. the conversation tonight. It's been an absolute pleasure and delight for me. Oh, thank you very much, Louise. It's, it's a pleasure too. Okay. Okay, Claire. Yeah, thanks, Louise. I just watching your work, Paul. It's just it's mesmerising, um, and and lovely to see studio where the magic happens. Uh, really wonderful. Thank you so much, and please come back again. Um, oh, hope you all enjoyed that. <laughs> I really mean that. Um, hope you all enjoyed that at home. Next Arts Fest online event is on Tuesday, the eighth of June at 2 p.m. and it's the third in our intellectual property and art series and this one is about trademarks and brands. You can book for free through Eventbrite. Hope to see you there. Have a great weekend. Thanks for watching. Have a good bye. weekend. Thanks everybody. Bye, bye Paul. Bye, bye. 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 <laughs>